United Parish of Upton. We are gathered here as equals, looking up to Jesus Christ. If you've come here in the same spirit, then we are chosen family in this place. You are God's beloved. And because we believe that about each one of us in our diversity, we are learning how to become a complex community, geographically unbound hybrid. So as we are learning how to house the holy in our physical gatherings and in our digital ones, I'm going to take care to introduce some expectations in our worship space this morning, okay? Now, the whole body of Christ, regardless of time or geography, is united by love. Technology like our mobile app and our new screen, which is coming very soon, are helping us realize that more than ever before. The screen is meant to show the parts of our body that are in this room, what is visible to our online community, and what our camera, Timothy, is looking at. I like to call our cam camera Timothy so that I'm reminded that, like Timothy in the Bible, it's young, but it's good. And it's here to help us connect with the gospel. Right? So starting this season of Advent, I'd like you to do as I have been doing. And challenge yourself to greet Timothy and the members of our body Timothy represents. What I'm inviting you to do is to come up during the service and pass them the peace. Right? Don't worry, we've got four Sundays in Advent, so you can get used to the notion, right? We are introducing a time of offering to these Advent services, and that's because as long as there have been followers of our God, there have been rituals of giving thanks to God for what we live on for what has been provided to us through creation and through community. You may use this offering time to give a financial gift, to practice generosity, and to support our ministries. And many of us give through the church app or through other digital options, so I encourage all of you who are here in person to um, go get a green coin. Uh, Deacons, where are our green coins right now? Oh, Karen is here, Vanna Whiting, and showing us where they are. Yes, so if you're here in the room, I encourage you to go get a green coin if you haven't already so that you can participate in the offering moment, however you give. Okay. Now, I'm going to be taking time in each of these services to speak to our children. I know our children have had a very difficult time and have had to wait a long time to get vaccinated. And we've not always been able to help them with that or visit with them in person. We do have resources for families that coordinate with today's worship in our weekly worship emails. So make sure that we have your email address if you have not been getting those. One more thing. I hope you will pray aloud and sing in the worship service. Those of you who are watching online are invited to sing along with our song leader at every opportunity. Those of you who are here in person are invited to listen to them singing with your spirit. And to stay, if you choose, after today's benediction and sending forth, when we can sing the closing carol together with our masks on. Yes, we will all be performing this worship together joining God who is already here. So this morning, who will remind us of God's faithfulness by ringing our bell? Thanks, Eric, you take Whitney with you?
God is faithful and present here today. I know the plans I have in mind for you, declares the Lord. I will bring you home after your long exile. The pandemic has laid bare and widened economic disparity locally and globally. It has made us raw with loss and mistrust. Yet, Advent calls our attention to a God of purpose and abundance, of energy and grace upon grace. As we enter the Advent season, how can our church become a house where the holy will be born anew? Not in our spare rooms, but in our midst. Not in our spare time, but ready or not. Not for a new normal, but just as we are. With God's help, don't we already have all we need to be a center for spirit, offering respite, sustenance, and care, opening the doors ever wider to those seeking shelter from the onslaught of life? We are not meant to do it all, but through our community online and our physical resources in Upton, we have what we need to do something that meaningfully resembles the future we pray for God to bring. The prophets reveal God's calling to care for our neighbors and make room in the inn. Yes, this Advent, you are invited to worship God among us, God of purpose and abundance, energy, and grace upon grace. As we do so, the lonely and frightened spaces within us are filled with the light of hope, peace, joy, and love. Invite Oriana and Tim Murphy forward to light our Advent candle. Today we offer the light of hope to illuminate the door of welcome. May this light shine in our hearts, in our lives, and in our church. May, we hope, may hope awaken us to possibilities and lead us to greater hospitality. There is room in this inn, a house for the holy.
Now, if there are any kiddos in the congregation today who would like to come closer to get a better look, they are welcome to do so at this time. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> So today we start a special time of year called Advent. For the next several weeks, we will prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of Jesus. One way we can prepare is by making room in our lives for what matters most. So let's start with a call and response. I will say something, and then you'll respond each time with the words, we make room for Jesus. Say that with me. We make room for Jesus. And as you do, you can rub circles on your heart. We make room for Jesus. We make room for Jesus. Just like that. Very good. Now, excellent. I'm going to provide the call. Here we go. Make room for family. Make room for friends. We make room for Jesus. Make way for love that never ends. We make room for Jesus. Make room for others who need a hand. We make room for Jesus. Make room to listen, to understand. We make room for Jesus. Amen. Okay, so has anybody noticed anything interesting? Maybe maybe a little out of place or out of ordinary in the sanctuary? Timothy, you might need to look around a little bit and see if you can see anything strange. Now, there's plenty of things we might think of as strange based on our expectations of church and tradition, right? Wait a minute, what's What's that, just behind the Advent wreath? What's this? Is this usually here? No, not at all. Now this is the kind of thing I'm used to seeing maybe on my front doorstep, but not here in the church. Now, this is a time of year when we have to be careful about opening packages that are not addressed to us that come to the front door, right? But this one's here in the center of the church, and this is our, our place of worship. This is our spiritual home, so maybe it's meant for all of us. You think maybe we can open just this one, Whitney? You think so? Okay, let's, let's do it. I wonder what's inside. You think it's a gecko? Let's see. What do you think it is? Do you have a guess? Probably not plastic. Probably not plastic, because <laughs> Tim is old enough to read the words on the box. <laughs> oh, I think this is going to be a surprise. What's in there? Oh, what a great answer, Brian. Maybe nothing or maybe something we can't see. Yeah, this, this box, this is a special kind of box. Maybe we're disappointed if it doesn't have something shiny in it, but on the other hand, maybe it has the shiniest things in it. Because this is a box full of possibilities. You know, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about hope that first candle at the beginning of Advent. We're talking about being able to see the possibilities. What kind of possibilities do you think there are in a box like this? What kind of possibility comes along with a gift of this type? Hope is left at the bottom of every box. Hope is left at the bottom of every box. Let's see, what can we do with this box? Well, this would make an excellent Minecraft costume. <laughs> so I know what I'm doing for next Halloween. 
Oh, and you know, some of us here, we really love music. This box has the possibility of being a great drum. What kind of possibilities do you see in a box like this? You know, there were a lot of people who had big expectations when Jesus was coming into the world, of what they thought would happen, and they might have been a little underwhelmed or disappointed with the way that it actually played out. But God is always inviting us to see the possibilities, the surprises that are bigger than our expectations. Advent is a season of possibilities, of making room for new things, room for imagination, room for the spirit, room for friends, room for the possibility that a baby born in a stable can change the world. I can't wait to see what's going to happen with this box over the course of this season. Now, for the closing of our time for children, all of us are God's children, I want to teach you a song we can sing together. Advent is definitely a season for singing. The words are simple, and we can sing them to the chorus of the first Noel, which is our closing carol for today, too. The words are these, make room for hope, make room for hope. Jesus is coming, make room for hope. And it goes like this. Make room for hope, make room for hope. Jesus is coming, make room for hope. Friends at home, let's sing that together. Everybody here, listen for them singing. Make room for hope, make room for hope. Jesus is coming, make room for hope. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 and 4 through 14 out of the Common English Bible translation. The prophet Jeremiah sent a letter from Jerusalem to the few surviving elders among the exiles, to the priests and the prophets, and to all the people Nebuchadnezzar had taken to Babylon from Jerusalem. The Lord of heavenly forces, the God of Israel, proclaims to all the exiles have carried off from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and settle down, cultivate gardens and eat what they produce, get married and have children. Then help your sons find wives and your daughters find husbands in order that they too may have children. Increase in number there so that you don't dwindle away. Promote the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because your future depends on its welfare. The Lord of heavenly forces, the God of Israel, proclaims, don't let the prophets and diviners in your midst mislead you. Don't pay attention to your dreams. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I don't send them, declares the Lord. The Lord proclaims, when Babylon's 70 years are up, I will come and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. I know the plans I have in mind for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for peace, not disaster, to give you a future filled with hope. When you call me and come and pray to me, I will listen to you. When you search for me, yes, search for me with all your heart, you will find me. I will be present for you, declares the Lord, and I will end your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have scattered you, and I will bring you home after your long exile, declares the Lord.
Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill my gracious promise with the people of Israel and Judah. In those places and at that time, I will raise up a righteous branch from David's line, who will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is what he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. This reading comes from the same book of Jeremiah, chapter 33. Advent is a season of preparation, but for the Christian church, it is uncharacteristically short. There is some historical precedent for it being a longer season, and we've observed that. We called it Extended Advent here at United Parish of Upton years ago. But on the other hand, it is in some way appropriate for this whole season to be fewer than 40 days long. 40 days. You know, that's the length of time that the Bible lays out as a symbol that means a long time. So that means we have something less than a long time to prepare for the incarnation of love among us. And that's only right, especially this year. We don't have a long time to plan and get organized for some distant future because any and every day now, we know something can change. Here we are, disrupted, disoriented, and Christ is ringing our doorbell. Will we consent to housing the holy like this? In our midst and in our mess? This year, most of us had the choice to travel for Thanksgiving, a choice to host or be hosted. Traveling was a very different experience in the first century. Nowadays, we do as much as possible to keep ourselves to ourselves, right? From your personal seat number, to your taxi, to your private hotel room with those individual coffee pods, your experience as a traveler today is, a poten is potentially a lonely one. In those places which might be crowded or public, all you need is a charged up battery to protect you from interacting with anyone you do not choose to see. Right? In fact, there are many choices you can make as a traveler today. But in the first century, traveling meant surrender. It was not possible to do it alone. In fact, those Christmas cards that we're so used to with only the donkey and Mary and Joseph in the dark, faintly glowing, they're an odd fantasy. The picture should show them surrounded by fellow travelers, bustling and negotiating on an early form of public transit, like a wagon train or a caravan. Mary and Joseph were not fleeing to Bethlehem at the last minute. They were part of a government-mandated exercise which affected everyone. The roads were crowded that Christmas, as they often are now, and they had no privacy. But the inn was full precisely because of this mass transit event, and even there, there would have been no individual cubicles with individual bathrooms. People would have been piling their belongings at their head or at their feet and settling down to rest in open common rooms. Some of them may be neighbors who knew each other or extended family. Some of them young cousins unwilling to stop giggling after lights out. They stayed together for warmth on cold desert nights, for safety in strange places, to share resources so that they didn't have to find a way to carry their leftovers. On my dad's side, I have many cousins. And I remember as a child being piled into cars willy-nilly 
just counting heads to make sure that we arrived with the same number we left with. They, too, weren't just gathered together at the end of the journey, but all along the way. It was hard for many reasons, but it probably wasn't lonely. So when they arrived at the place to stay, it might have been that because the baby was coming soon, Mary and Joseph wanted to stay together and not be piled in with the others. Or it could have been that they were concerned about climbing the stairs in Mary's condition. And, as the story says, it was crowded. There wasn't room upstairs in the inn. So, like many grandmas, grandpas, aunties, and uncles, the host set up one more place to sleep downstairs, in the front room, on the floor, without a door or walls for privacy or separation from curious family pets. In the first century, that was where they kept their precious livestock and the traveling animals, too. Like any host, the innkeeper might have worried that Mary and Joseph would be offended at this unconventional arrangement, that they'd feel uncomfortable or slighted, or that their presence there would be an inconvenience for the host's plans or for the other guests. Maybe that's why they said there was no room. In the past few years, thinking about idolatry, a word that's mentioned so often in the Old Testament and in the prophets, thinking about it has led me to observe that there is nothing we humans can't make too complicated to fix. If you took a moment and wrote down the things that have most annoyed you or got in your way this week, you'd have a pretty good insight into how idolatry erodes love. Idolatry is not about what you call God or the style of prayer you use. It's not even about the scripture you read. No, idols are not made from our search for God. They are made from our need for certainty and control. Most often, our idols have familiar names like professional, reliable, rational, practical, productive, or even good host. They're hard to crush because they're so closely tied to our sense of identity and self-acceptance. But every now and then, righteous people go around crushing idols and recalling people to the worship of God. The book of Jeremiah, which you heard from this morning, this book was begun when a righteous person was king. King Josiah crushed idols and called for the large-scale reorganizing of priorities around relationship with the living God. He was bold and a risk-taker, and who knows what could have happened if he had lived longer. But when he died, the Babylonians were able to quickly take over and begin deporting people as a slave caste, destroying not only the possibilities that had been born under a righteous king, but all that had come before it, including the traditions of the idols and the identities that they were constructed to serve. So it's a good thing we have Jeremiah along for this ride today. He began his ministry with hope for a just and peaceful future, a time of positive progress, momentum, and growth with God. But Jeremiah was deported too. And we can bet that the leaders over him were not particularly interested in his identity as the descendant of priests and his calling as a prophet. Still, maybe it was his hope that empowered him to challenge his neighbors, not to seek security in pleasing people, in gaining protection or success in Babylonian society, or giving in to lives of grief, resentment, and suffering. Now, Jeremiah saw their extreme situation and called them to take care of themselves and each other, to continue to invest in their relationship with God, in their health, and in their joy. 
because this present loss was not the end of the story for them. And it is not the end of the story for us either. It does not feel good that we cannot see our beloved online and cannot truly share this whole experience with you. It does not feel good not to be able to get to know newcomers in the old way. It does not feel good to wear masks or to not sing or to wait for our little ones to be fully vaccinated. This is not the future that we have envisioned and been praying for. And this is not where we are hoping to stay. Yet we're not going back to the way things were either. We have learned so much since we've been given a few years of a different kind of life. Even if we could invite back everyone who came to the five o'clock Christmas Eve service of 2019, now there would be seats left empty by those who have gone to sit at God's heavenly table. We do not know yet what we shall be, what we are waiting for, what realities we will see just a few years from now. We are not yet in a position to bring that vision to life. But we enter this not very long Advent season with Jeremiah because Jeremiah is the prophet who challenges us not to turn to our idols. Jeremiah challenges us to remember that while we don't know what is coming, we do know the one who holds our lives. So this time is not a waste. This time counts. In this time, we can look around at who is here and who is connecting and who is in need. We can make another bed on the living room floor. We can invest in each other, in our relationship with God, and in the kind of community which is not driven by identity or idolatry, but by vulnerability and connection. We can make use of our time and our resources. And yes, we do have resources. We can be purposeful. Maybe the things we build now will hold up for generations, but maybe they won't even be necessary where God is leading us, and that doesn't matter. God has promised us peace and reunion and a future, and God keeps God's promises. Mary Lou Redding writes, God calls us to come home for Christmas. God calls us to come back from all those places where we have settled for less than the fullness of life promised to us in Christ. God calls us back from all the ambitions and possessions we have pursued, thinking that they would satisfy us. God calls us to let go of any bitterness and resistance to forgive that block the light of love from warming us. God calls us to come home and to rest, to be embraced by one who loves us as we are. God offers us a place where we are fully known and also fully accepted. We say, this is not enough time. We have no room. And then Joseph points to the living room floor or to the car in the driveway. And we reply, you don't want to sleep there. Surely there is a less messy option, a better option, a roomier option, a cleaner option, an option offered by someone who is a professional at this and has done it many times before. Surely there is an option less startling, less embarrassing for us. But loving God will teach us how to see possibilities. Here we are, disrupted and disoriented, and Christ is ringing our doorbell. Will we consent to housing the holy like this? In our midst and in our mess? The scandal of the stable, of the inn, is how Christ reveals to us what we always had, but never cared for, never imagined was how God planned to build the kingdom of God. I'm going to end.
invite forward at this time Fran Graveson and the members of her support team. Cheryl, there's a microphone right there. You push hard on the button in the center, it'll turn green. There you go. Now, beloved, from time to time, we experience a new beginning in our faith journey. When the Holy Spirit breaks into our lives to inspire us, to lead us, and to deepen our commitment to Christ. Today, we praise the Lord for what's been happening in Fran's life. Today, we are happy to recognize Fran and celebrate her response to God's call through ordained ministry in the United Church of Christ. I invite you to stand and join with me in prayer for Fran as she prepares for this ministry. Oh, quick, before you do that, I have another thing to say. Yes. I haven't even explained what we're doing. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. <clears throat> Fran, we rejoice with you that you have heard God's call to the ordained ministry, and that you have said with Isaiah, here I am, send me. This parish has recommended you as a candidate for this ministry. That's what we're doing. Yeah. And as you pray, prepare for it in the months and years ahead, we will stand with you and offer you our fullest support. Okay, Cheryl, now lead them in the prayer, please. <laughs> okay, thank you for standing. Uh, Spirit of the living God, we pray for, pray Fran, for Fran as she, she prepares, prepares to, to answer, answer your call. Your call. Guide, guide her, her as she, she faces, faces further, further decisions, decisions and, strengthen and strengthen her when the path, path is long and hard. Keep, keep us, us open to your guidance as, as we continue, continue to offer our support, support as we as listen for your, for your call in our, in our own lives. lives. This, this we, we ask, ask in Jesus' Jesus name. name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite everybody to extend a hand of blessing toward Fran. Fran, in the name of this congregation, I commend you to this work and pledge to you our prayers, encouragement, and support. May the Holy Spirit guide and strengthen you that in this and in all things you may do God's will in the service of Jesus Christ. May God give you courage, patience, and vision, and may God strengthen us all in our Christian vocation of witness to the world and of service to others. Let us pray. O oh, light of God and love, of God of light and love, the one who gives us life and provides all the resources with which our lives can be meaningfully sustained. We span, stand in special need of an extra measure of wisdom, grace, and love. Gracious and loving God, you have called us to follow you and we ask, am I worthy? Am I capable? May we grow in trusting you Hear the prayers of our hearts and forgive us for not always using our potential responsibly. Transform our defeatist attitudes. Help us in our discernment and may we have the forbearance to listen. Grant us the spiritual gifts that we need for today and all of our tomorrows. Give us courage to try new behaviors which are filled with purpose and love and keep us from being led astray. We lift our hearts to you today as the source of strength and inspiration. We marvel at the many challenges and possibilities that lie within this day. Give us grateful hearts for work to do and this, for the strength with which to do it. Let your spirit push us onward and help us not to be distracted by difficulties. Help us to become inspired by what might be and instill within each of us a desire to face every challenge with the possibility of excelling. May we find our sense of calling and purpose, and may our personal witness be an example for others. Nurture us to a maturity that wants for others that which we wish for ourselves. Nurture us in growth toward a more perfect expression of love to all people in all places and at all times. We thank you for your abiding presence as we lift our hearts to you. Amen. Now, Fran is on a journey that will take her several years. And these are those who, some of those who have pledged to accompany her on that journey and keep faith with her. 
but they can only do so with your help and support. So for Fran's journey, and for these, her companions and supporters, can we show our blessing and praise? Or ask someone that went to seminary whether they want to speak yeah. or not. Yeah. Um, no, I just wanted to thank this congregation for all of your love and support over the last couple of years. And I really, um, it's important uh, to Jen and I that we have a home um, and a family to share this journey with. So thank you. Amen. You may be seated. the doors of our hearts to honesty before God about what we've done and left undone that created less hope in a hurting world. Let us breathe together. Let us breathe in this regret. Breathe out this regret and breathe in the life-giving, forgiving spirit of God. Let us breathe out again the peace of Christ. In this moment, we open the doors of this church, filling it with the compassion of Christ for all those among us who are struggling. We remember and we pray for we who are suffering economic hardship and in security in basic needs. You came that we might have life and abundantly. We pray for we who are suffering mentally, finding it difficult to cope, and those who are in grief, especially Anina and the Wolpert, Myers Hudson, Gert, and Coffin families. You make ways where there seem to be none, and your love is life. Pray for we who are suffering illness or injury, especially Mary, Michael, Karen, Noah, Linda, and Scott. You are the great physician. There is nothing that can separate us from your love. We pray for we who are suffering loneliness and isolation. You abide with us and you advocate for us with sighs too deep for words. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, oh, tidings of comfort and joy. We remember and we pray for we who are suffering discrimination, fear, and violence. You crafted us with awe and with love, and you declared our future of peace. Now may the advent of compassion be born in us, reside within us, move outward from us to meet the needs of the world making a house for the holy that is each and every child of God.
pray this in the name of Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Bible doesn't actually mention an innkeeper in the story of Jesus' birth. But this popular notion is alive in our imaginations. What if we see the innkeeper as someone who, with a full house, decided to accept the presence of God in the mess? To claim every resource for grace? What if we endeavored to do the same to provide ministry, to house the holy in ways we have not yet imagined? I invite our hosts forward to receive the offering. They're an invitation to you to consider and to place in the manger your reflections. How have you received grace upon grace? How have you been welcomed? How have you experienced the gift of hospitality? Each Sunday after this one, I will read some of what you have shared from that place. So feel free to place them there before, during, after the service, even during the week as you stop by the church. We raise these gifts before God, all they are and all they represent, and ask for God's blessing on our past, on our present, and on what is yet to come. Magnify them so that we become a place and people who house the holy. In your name we pray. Amen. service, you are welcome to receive a gift of a cupcake in celebration of Fran and her growth and beginning of this stage of her journey in ministry. Now may God's door of welcome swing open in your heart and in your life. May God's humble first dwelling remind you of the plenty you already know. And may the Spirit lead you into more possibility and hospitality than you can imagine, making room in the inn for all. May it be so for you. May it be so for us. May it be so for this church. Amen. As you go, go in peace to love and serve both God and neighbor. Those who are remaining may stand for our closing hymn.